Comics Coast to Coast is brought to you by patrons like you. If you'd like to help the show out, head on over to patreon.com forward slash comics C to C and show us a little bit of your love. Your sweet, sweet love. I mean, like a dollar's worth of love. And we'll take that love and hug it and squeeze it and make it do podcast things that you'll enjoy. So come on, see what happens. This is Comics Coast to Coast. Here by us is Brian Dunaway, and you're listening to Comics Coast to Coast, episode 308, the Dave Kellett interview, part two. Before we talk to Dave, going to reach over here and say hello to Joel Duggan of Forge Publishing. Joel. Hello, how are you? I am doing well. Last week, I missed out on a great interview. Uh, oh, thanks. And I, yeah, you guys did great. Did did fantastic. I always have full confidence in you guys. And we had a great guest last week, so it all worked out well, right? Yeah, Cleo was fantastic. And she's super talented and had lots of really cool stories to tell about uh, storyboarding in the film industry, which is really cool. Excellent. We do like the stories. Also with us today is Matthew Descharm of Matt the Wad. Matt, how are you? I am highly entertained by looking at Dave Kellett's Instagram photo because oh. it's him wearing a, a Captain Crunch outfit, and I <laughs> that has to be the first question of the interview when you let's, introduce him. Like, well, let's, where let's where do the hell that. did he get that outfit? Where did where did he get that outfit? So let's let's do just that. Let's invite uh, Dave Kellett back on the show. Dave, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time uh, out of your very busy schedule to sit down with us at Comics Coast to Coast and talk about all things Dave Kellett. Uh, and uh, so give us a quick reminder of, of who you are and what you do. Ah, okay. Well, I am a Los Angeles-based cartoonist. I've been working online since 1998, wow. uh, and I do two comic strips. I do Sheldon, which is at sheldoncomics.com, um, and that is sort of a daily, uh, although not no longer daily, uh, sort of a gag-a-day humor strip. And then I do Drive, which is a long-form sci-fi uh, epic, although it's a comedy as well. And that's at drivecomic.com. And then I'm also the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped, which can be found at strippedfilm.com. So that's the the short version of my of my twenty year career online. <laughs> uh, summed up quite well, Matt. You said you had a question about some uh, some some headwear. I think it was. Yeah, it's not just headwear. It looks like the full Captain Crunch outfit. I I gotta know. Do you still have that thing? Tell, please tell me that's not shopped in there. So the uh, the Captain Crunch outfit to which he is referring is can be seen on my Instagram account. So it's uh, Dave Kellett, all one word, is the Instagram account. And uh, that particular outfit uh, was made by me. That foam hat is gigantic. And uh, <laughs> that was for over, the, over my 20 years or so living in Los Angeles, I've done a fair amount of either sketch comedy or improv comedy uh, in and around L.A. theaters. And that Captain Crunch outfit was for a sketch comedy troupe that I was involved with. And I ended up using it for, uh, I think, of Halloween. And that's when that photo was taken. Um, it's a delightfully goofy Captain Crunch. Because you see a Captain Crunch outfit in real life, and it's the brightest blue and the brightest <laughs> yellow. And that hat is like four feet above my head. So it's also just fun to walk around on, on Halloween and go, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Follow-up question, Crunch Berries or no Crunch Berries? Uh, I I like the crunch berries. Absolutely, it's a, it's a, uh, it's it, there's nothing that that is uh, in any way remotely uh, health based in that cereal, and when you see it in crunch berry form, <laughs> it just reminds you of how uh, how uh, abjectly corn sugarish it is. So that's that's the one <laughs> nice. for me. Yeah. And if you're going to remove the top layer of the skin of, uh, of the roof of your mouth, you might as well do it with red eye uh, number five, right? I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it gives a little a little extra oomph for for the dentist to go in and and scream at you. <laughs> That's great. We love uh, we love Captain Crunch. We love cereal here on Comics Coast to Coast. We have had many episodes where we've talked about our uh, obsession with growing up with cartoons, uh, and Saturday morning cartoons especially, and we uh, it's all tied in with cereal. So we were happy to see uh, that you are a Captain Crunch fan. Very Aficionado, good. yeah. Exactly. Aficionado. Exactly. Right. Excellent. Okay, Joel. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Joel. Were you breathing? You'd- 
Oh no, yeah. that was me breathing. I was oh, I was actually just going to say thank you for having Mac for having me back for your 308th episode. I'm glad when we last spoke in 2013, I we had agreed that I would be back for the 308th episode and so I'm, gl- I'm so glad that we uh, <laughs> we stuck to that plan 4 years ago. Uh, yeah, right. it's really worked out well for us, so that's good. It really has. That that is true. We, uh back on episode 157 in 2013 was the last time we talked to you. And at that time, uh, you were working, uh, I believe you had just finished uh, filming of Stripped Film and uh, were getting ready to distribute, I think, if that's, if I remember. Yeah, that sounds right. about right. And so since that day, uh, Stripped was released online and we were able to get it uh, to number one on iTunes for a day, which was fun. That's and great. then uh, we got it on Netflix for two years, which is fun. And uh, I think, as you all probably know, we got Bill Watterson to do the poster for it, which was super fun. And yeah. uh, so that film was was just a delight for me. As uh, I I've, I have two master's degrees in cartooning, and I never thought I would put them to use in any way, shape, or form. And that film was probably <laughs> the only uh, close approximation I'll have to using my academic side on uh, on my love for comics. So anyway, it was. I'm really glad that it got out into the world and that it was received well. Right. Any any yeah. plans uh, for a follow up, or can you say yet? Or yes, or we you... actually have two. We have two ideas for a follow up film, which we might be starting in the next year or two. Um, both of which would cost more and take longer. And that one took um, four years and I think two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to make. So um, we're both kind of like holding off on that a little bit because <laughs> it's a long commitment in time and money. Uh, like we had to do two kickstarters for that one. And like I said, had to commit four years to it. So knowing that the next one would be bigger. Um, but the two ideas we basically would like to do is um, uh, a very long uh, half bio, half um, reenactment of Windsor McKay's life and career. Oh, and the reason I say reenactment is we, there's a couple of scenes like we'd like to do uh, his vaudeville scenes where he would take um, Gertie the Dinosaur to silent movie houses and tour her around. But right. he was physically there interacting with her. Right. Um, and there's a couple silent movie houses in L.A. that we'd like to film at and reenact that moment with actor friends. Um, so, But all of that would cost so much money. Uh, so to do a biopic of him uh, and, and then also do some reenactments, uh, reenactments would be right. pricey. So that's the, the bigger one that we want to do. And then the other one we want to do is um, on the nature of creativity. And uh, you know, so many people ask cartoonists, how they get their ideas. And so one of our favorite parts about Stripped was talking to people about uh, where and how and what they do to force their ideas to come to the fore. And we wanted to do an hour and a half film on what do you do when you don't have an idea and the deadline is 40 minutes from now. Um, (laughs) And because cartoonists, uh, uh, more than most, maybe the only other people would be advertising people, know how to gin up ideas or uh, or force ideas with uh, an hour or two to go um, and get it out there on a regular basis. So um, we think it'd be fun to go around and talk to editorial cartoonists, cartoonists, comic strip cartoonists, comic book cartoonists, um, and, and New Yorker, all the all the different angles of cartooning, and talk about the nature of creativity and forcing it when it's not coming naturally. So those are the two film ideas that we're we're bouncing around. I'm looking cool. forward to that. I'm looking forward to both of those. If if you can make that happen, please make it happen. I'd love to know the answer to the second. What to do when you're screwed? I love that. Yeah, I I think uh, there's something very marketable too about the uh, something a title something along the lines of where do you get your ideas? Uh, Because that is the eternal question that cartoonists and really artists of all uh, stripes are asked. So um, I think it'd be a fun one to make. It'd be a really fun one to make. I think. Um, So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Like I said, it's just it's a four or five year commitment. Um, Granted, it's a joy filled commitment. Like making strip was one of the most joy filled things I've ever done, but uh, Mm. it, it is a commitment. So. Um, I want to get a couple books out into the world and then I will go back to, uh, to filmmaking. Yeah. I think the, one of the things that has come to pass since strip was released as well was the availability online of a lot of the extended interviews. And, um, that's where I found, I mean, like I, I love the film and actually I just found my copy of it the other day. Um, but I, um, I really enjoyed access to, the extended interviews and I thought that was a brilliant uh, a brilliant move to kind of put those out there for the the hardcore people to kind of download and digest. Yeah, I mean uh, to me uh, it, I always thought about it like if if 14-year-old me could sit down and listen to an interview with Jim Davis or Kate Beaton or Ryan North or you know name anybody else that was in that movie um, I would have jumped at it. So to me it would seem like a natural thing to given the nature of digital distribution make full-length interviews 
available to the public uh, where people could sit in their studio while they're painting or drawing or illustrating and mm-hmm. listen to Mort Walker talk about cartooning or listen to Greg Evans talk about cartooning or Kate Beaton or, or Meredith Grand or any of those people. Um, and so that to me was really fun to get that out into the world uh, because for people like yourselves and myself that want to dive deep into cartooning and the, the practice of it and the history of it, it's, it's really fun to have that out there. Right. And uh, I found an interesting way to consume this as well is on VHX TV. Uh, you allow people to uh, purchase just the interviews, right? Like uh, if I just want to watch the Jim Davis interview. Yeah, so like if someone goes to uh, strippedfilm.com, it's all one word, um, you can see the link to it. And you can either buy individual interviews, I think they're like a dollar ninety nine or something. They're two hour interviews for a dollar ninety nine. Or you can get <coughs> excuse me for the cough. You can get like thirty interviews for uh, uh, some smaller sum. And right. uh, and uh, it's really fun. It's it's fun to be able to have access to all those. And uh, yeah, great. like I said, I just enjoy a great the resource. The historian in me likes that those are out there, and I, I wanted to make sure that they got over to Ohio State for their archives. <laughs> and um, so it's been it's been nice to know that it sort of added to the to the body of interview work out there. Right. Yeah, that's going to be a nice notch on the belt too. Yeah, it's been fun. Well, mm-hmm. What was he saying, Matt? I, I think I missed it. Oh, I was saying another great thing about the film is. I know a lot of us are familiar with an artist's work, but not a lot of us like seem to realize that there is a indeed a person behind it. So for me, it was also great to see, oh, like that's what Jim Davis looks like, or you know, stuff like that. <laughs> right? Were you surprised by anybody, uh, Matt? Like, oh my, I didn't realize Jim Davis. The had look a of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never knew no, he had well, Anakin scar across his face. <laughs> No, it was more surprising to me that I had never actually pictured mm. what these people looked like. I somehow it's like they were just their art. Right, right. Interesting. Oh, that's a good yeah. The, the one thing, and I, I for privacy reasons we didn't include it, but uh, it would have been fun too to show you some of the exteriors and interiors of certain cartoonists. Uh, right. Jim Davis's uh, entire shop in Indiana there is out in the middle of Nowheresville, Indiana, and you crest a hill of, you have soy on the left of you and corn on the right of you, mm. and then you crest a field, uh, you know, a little hill, and all of a sudden in the middle of the fields is a four gigantic buildings with uh, Garfield uh, symbolism all over it and uh, 68 people working on Garfield in the middle of nowhere, Indiana. It's amazing to see. Right. And uh, so then you go to Mort Walker's house in New Jersey, and it's the, it's the former house of uh, Victor Borglum. I think I'm pronouncing that right who is the artist that carved Mount Rushmore and later on Crazy Horse. Wow. And and this house is literally built out of living stone. So he carved the house in some sections rather than built it. And um, so you walk into Mort Walker's house and there's a fireplace that's maybe 30 feet high by 15 feet across. And you can you know, walk in and Mort, it's 10 a.m. and Mort Walker goes, hey, would you boys like some whiskey? And you're like, oh boy, I guess I'm having whiskey by this fireplace at 10 a.m. All right. This. <laughs> this is the true cartoonist life. Uh, and, then, and, like and his wife brings out Oreos to go with the whiskey. So that's what we do. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was Did delightful. You dip it? So, like, what's that? Did you tip it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, Oreos straight and into the, the whiskey. Exactly. Right. And then uh, Lynn Johnson, we went up to her house, also in Nowheresville, uh, Ottawa, I guess, uh, in Canada. And um, it was snowing when we pulled up to her house, uh, which was, again, out in the middle of nowhere. And as we walk in, there's like three, uh, not shotguns, it was sort of rifles, uh, right by the inside of her door. And I'm like, oh, hey, Lynn, hey, what's that for? <laughs> She's like, oh, those deer, they're always eating my carrots. So she's wow. got like two, yeah, she's got two rifles, three rifles right by the front door to, to scare off deer. It's great. Oh, um, she takes it just, serious. Yeah, it's awesome to walk into different cartoonists and see the, the way they live. You know, it's great. I really enjoyed it. They're people is the, uh, I think, is the, the final bit on yeah, that piece, right? They, they spend a lot of time in their studios by themselves. So when you, when you crack that shell and start talking with them about their art and their thoughts about their art, it made really lovely conversations that would last, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, some cases. So, um, that was some of the best points in my cartooning life. Right. Not, not to, not to linger on this too much. I love that. I love the piece, but I also want to talk about Sheldon and drive. Um, so how long did it take you to film? Because that sounds like a lot of traveling to each cartoonist. Were you doing like one a week, 
how many people were you visiting? Yeah, the um, the uh, we ended up doing seventy interviews, and um, let's see, I'm trying to think what uh, seventy. It was about two years of traveling, and we would do. Sometimes we would take entire road trips. So I would say goodbye to my wife, and we would fly <laughs> to the East Coast. <laughs> And we would do like six or seven interviews over the course of five days in a rental car driving around the East Coast. And then there would be some times where we'd have to specifically fly to someone. So like Lynn Johnson was out in enough of Nowheresville, uh, Canada, where we couldn't roll in another interview nearby. So we would fly directly to her. Um, and then some people, uh, there's a few interviews and you can kind of spot them uh, in the film where – it, it, they look like a shared location or an industrial space. And that's because we did a few people at Ohio State when they were there for a festival. So we kind of rented a space in a nearby theater and, and interviewed them there. Uh, and uh, so you kind of got people where you could and using the logistics and money of a super low budget documentary. So, um, uh, you know, you make it work. And um, right. some interviews that the, the situation was better acoustically than others, uh, but you do the best you can. And, and there you go. Well, you you did a great job. I've I've seen uh, I've seen a few of these interviews. I haven't watched all of them yet, though. I need to go back and do more research because I, when I consume it, I want to stare really hard and look at every little nuanced piece. I'm, I'm I'm like that. I like to see every little. I like to look at the backgrounds and see what's going on back there. Yeah, so like I get I get a sense of childlike excitement and seeing people's uh, desk setups and like I don't know if yes. you ever saw the book that I think either Dark Horse or Image put out maybe 10, 15 years ago that just showed cartoonists in their studios. Hmm. And oh man, I love that I book. I miss so that. Much. Oh, it's great. There it's like a, a 14 inch by 10 inch book. And so you get these huge, beautiful black and white photos of cartoonists uh, studios and desk setups. And I, I just, I could pour over those photos for days because uh, it's, it's so fun. I mean, you know, because none of us went to school for this, or for the most part, no one of our generation did. And so, when you can get a snapshot of someone's studio, it's, it's delightful. Interesting. And I ended up building a whole custom cartoon desk, in, in part designed on five or six different cartoonists that I saw around the country, and how they had either modded their own desks or built their own. Um, I so, remember watching that happen. Instagram um, I, or Twitter, I think you had updates and stuff that you were posting. Yeah, I ended up trying uh, building a, a standing desk that's a split level and has a light box built into it and a couple different light sources and specific kind of drawers and and shelving for that a cartoonist would need. And um, that was largely built based on the setups that uh, Mel Lazarus had in Los Angeles and um, Lynn Johnson's custom built desk in Canada and uh, um Patrick McDonald's for Mutt's. He has a really cool uh, desk setup as well. So um, I kind of cobbled together the best ideas that they had with their desks and built my own. Um, and I, I love it. I love it. That's great. Anyway, that, you, not that you want to hear about my desk. For, oh, I, <laughs> for well, you, you would be wrong. That's exactly but, but what we're if you, if someone If someone is curious, you can just Google Dave Kellett desk, and I, I would imagine you'll see a photo. I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at about uh, two dozen photos of it. Or do, okay. uh, at least at least a dozen and, populating the first couple of rows of Google for sure. Yeah, there and you go. Doing, right, so yeah. There, yeah, if you image, uh, you might see a few shots of my older desk, but you'll you'll get a sense of which one the standing desk is if you, if yeah. you just Google my name and and. Desk. And if you're if you're listening to this uh, through the many feeds we have, I also record this weekly uh, video of me talking. Uh, usually not the guest. We'll occasionally have that, uh, and I I'm pulling up these pictures as well. So if you watch this on YouTube, if you follow us on uh, YouTube. Uh, comments coast to coast you can see some of these pictures as well or do your own google search either way Whoever makes yeah it. and you know uh, you know what's fun is that um <laughs> oh, that's is cool i uh, i also are in googling dave kelly desk it turns out that some, i had posted my plans for the desk my drawn plans for the desk and it looks like someone has incorporated them into a website on how to build your own custom desk. So if someone what? has plans which is great that's fine I, that's why i posted them publicly so that people could share them uh right. but it's kind of cool to see. Anyway, so that's the internet. People will take things and make them their own. <laughs> and my name has been scrubbed off of that that JPEG. So great. All right. Well, good. Now I'm less happy with this. <laughs> oh, the problem is real for everybody. It does, it's not just it's not just the some struggle people. is real. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that I that I wanted to get back to in terms of your cartooning is that the since the last time that you're on, um, you've actually picked up a couple of awards for your cartoon work. 
Yes, which means that uh, I, I now get a free burger anytime I walk into a McDonald's. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, yeah, so uh, Sheldon over the years has been nominated for an Eisner a couple times, um, but has never won that one. And then in the last few years, Drive and Sheldon both got nominated for the, Ru- the Silver Rubin Awards, which is the National Cartoonist Society Awards. And Sheldon won one last year. Oh, um, so that was fun. Yeah, that was, it's, been, it's been real nice. Um, it, like I, it, you know, in like most things you, as an artist, you immediately go back to hating yourself the next day, but, uh, it's, it's a good 40 minute high and then you forget about it and you go back to hating the next, the next idea you have for tomorrow. So, <laughs> uh, that, yeah, I mean, cause and correct me if I'm wrong, the Rubens is voted on by peers. Yes. So that is um, the National Cartoonist Society is a group of cartoonists, all of whom make 50 percent or more of their income from cartooning. And it is mostly populated by newspaper cartoonists, uh, although there are people from Mad Magazine, from The New Yorker, from the animation world, all sorts of different things. And they are the voting body that votes on the Rubens. Um, The Eisners and the Harvey are more comic book uh, geared, but... You guys might know. I actually don't know who the voting body is for the Eisners and the Harveys. But that's a good question. We should we should look that up. Yeah, I feel like the Eisners are more along the lines of an Oscars. Like I think there's like a voting board. I know, I know there's a, an adjudicating body that nominates, but I don't know who votes on mm. them. But anyway, that yeah. does matter. Anyway, uh, so the <laughs> point was, hey, you you get to bring one of these home, which is awesome. I did, yes, and uh, it's uh, it sits above my desk. And actually, um, Stripped won the com- the San Diego Comic Con Film Festival, so it sits by. Oh, that's great. That yeah, so that uh, there's a few oh, awards. So whenever gener- I'm feeling blue, I look up and I go, oh, "I'm not a total failure." Right. You're generating quite the uh, trophy case, there, Mister. That, that's Good right. Job. Yes, yes, yeah. it goes right next to my third place uh, track finish from high school. <laughs> so that's the that I have. So there we go. <laughs> It's working out well for you. So I got to tell you guys, life is coming up, Dave. That <laughs> yeah. finally has some finally had some company, right? Well, I'd like to get on uh, while we still have time talking about this new Kickstarter that you have uh, on Kickstarter. It is Anatomy of Animals Kickstarter. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So uh, I about a year and a half, two years ago, did a comic strip that said it was a, called an anatomy of uh, actually I was going to say it was anatomy of walrus, but I think I did an anatomy of a pug first. Mm-hmm. And the basic idea is that it's like those old high school biology cross sections that, that would point out, you know, leg, horn, ear, thorax, right. tail, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and what I ended up doing with these is that each animal I would kind of through the process of describing, you know, different body parts, you would get a sense of their personalities. And they were all kind of sad sacks in different ways. And I really enjoyed this process of writing and and drawing these different animals. So um, I ended up doing dozens and dozens of them. And now we're collecting them all into one book called Anatomy of Animals. And it's going to be put together like a faux 1910, 1920s uh, biology book. And we're laying it out actually as we speak, and it's looking really cool. Um, uh, so it's over at uh, animalkickstarter.com, and we're about 80% of the way towards the goal. So it looks like, knock on wood, we're going to make it. So I'm pretty excited right. about that. Yeah, you still have about 19 days to go. No no sense in no one waiting, though. Go ahead if you're listening and you're into to, uh, Dave Kellett's art. Uh, this is great. This is And your humor, too, because I think this is where this really shines, is your humor just really comes through because I want to learn interesting things about anatomy of a crab, but I find I'm laughing more than maybe I'm learning. I'm not sure. Yeah. You're learning. Uh, your learning will not be uh, heavy on this. If you're looking for, uh, you know, <laughs> the biology of a crab, this is a no go. But if you're looking about right. how a crab does on Tinder or uh, how they go about <laughs> picking their nose, then this is the book for you. Uh, right. But no, you will. You, this will ab- absolutely bring your grade down in biology if you read this book. So no, <laughs> don't look forward for any uh, suitable knowledge. No, <laughs> right. So I'm curious because I think you mentioned like a walrus and a pug as how it started. But how does how did this work itself into your daily strip with Sheldon? Like, is it because I know there's a pug in Sheldon? Like, is that how it started? Yeah, so I that's a great question because a lot of people I, I so I've been doing Sheldon since uh, spring of 1998 online and for the first I don't know 10 15 years it was actually for the first 10 years it was 7 days a week 
And then for the next five years, it was five days a week. And it was all cast based and all humor based on that cast. And um, then about, I don't know, five to eight years ago, I, I said, you know what? Uh, I can either start creating new strips to do on the side, like a whole nother title on a whole nother website, which is what I did for Drive. Or I can just draw whatever the heck I want on Sheldon and the people that get fussy with that can go somewhere else or the people that like it can keep reading. So what ends up happening on Sheldon is there's still continuing characters and still continuing uh, sort of motifs and themes in those characters that go on. But then every once in a while I'll do entirely um, uh, non-sequitorial cartoons like these Anatomy of Animal strips or I'll do uh, autobio strips, which I previously wouldn't have done. Um, and so it's basically just a way for me at the 18 year point to keep it fresh for myself. Um, mm. And so I've, I've really enjoyed it and thankfully enough other people have enjoyed it that it's, it's still kicking. So it's great. Well, I think too that at, at that age in a in a comic strip or in an, in a property's life, like you get some leeway where people are not just there to see Sheldon and and the recurring characters. They're there to check in with you, you know, the artist and your take on life. And like they people that have been there for that long realize that it's your voice that they're hearing through multiple characters. So more stuff from you, I think, gives a little bit more leeway. Or it's a lot harder for an artist that's only been at it for maybe two or three years to start doing like, oh well, hey, I'm kind of getting a stuck with the strip. I'm gonna throw in like this cool dolphin comic. And people are like, wait, what? Because that's not what they sign up for. Right, exactly. <laughs> and there's also the, the there's a reason why um uh Bill Watterson walked away from Calvin and Hobbes after 10 years and why Burke Brethren walked away from Bloom County after, I don't know what it was, 15 years, uh, which is that there's sort of a natural life to the arc of jokes and recurring jokes. And if you go back to the well one too many times, you start to feel like Andy Cap. Um, with where you're like, hey, how many more times can I write an irascible drunk that's uh, misogynistic? Uh, you're like, no, right. can't do that anymore. Yeah. So uh, um, basically, the, when you get to that natural point in the comic strip, you can either quit it, which is what a lot of people who started around the same time have done, or you can uh, work in different styles and different ways of telling jokes, which is what I've done. And so I've enjoyed it because I, I kind of came to a crossroads about five years ago of like, oh, you know what? If I wanted to, Sheldon could end right now. Uh, I, it's, it's had a good life and Drive is doing well. Um, but for me, I decided to transform Sheldon into the be all uh, or collect all site for any comics ideas that I had, even the ones that, that weren't Sheldon per se. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Good points. Uh, yeah. Okay, I really enjoy the bio ones, the the bio comics. The I really enjoy those ones. Yeah, I enjoy the bio ones enough where there's a tiny part of me that thinks that I might spin off a website of just bio comics, and that's uh, Kate Beaton is the one to thank for that because I I've always enjoyed her stuff, and I somewhere in a conversation with her I I started doing them myself. And I previously had never wanted to do bio comics, but because um, <laughs> for me in my twenties. Uh, bio comics are like everything that you dislike about underground comics. You know, it's like, uh, nobody gets me. Why am I misunderstood? My life is hard. And that's kind of every, <laughs> every cartoonist in their 20s bio comic. You're like, come on already. Whereas I much more prefer to draw bio comics where the reader can laugh at me uh, as being uh, a, a jackass. So um, <laughs> that's, my, that's my enjoyable way of drawing autobio comics. So once I realized that that for me was the way to do it, then autobio comics seemed less sad than they had done <laughs> when I was in my 20s and 30s. So anyway, say love you. Yeah. And that, and that, and there's something that that worked really well and something new that I noticed that you were doing. And that is the sequential photo feature on Instagram. And you know, like as an auto bio comic, like it really works there because a lot of times with Instagram, you're getting people's travel photos and food photos. I mean, like I'm guilty. That's exactly what I use it for. Mm -hmm. uh, but to have like auto bio comics from you and then be able to flick through panel by panel with the sequential stuff, I, I, I find it really engaging. Uh, did you was that your idea? Do you pick that up from someone else? Like, how's that working out for you? Oh, yeah, no. So that all credit for that has to go towards um, uh, Chris Halbeck, who I don't know if you guys are familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. So he does uh, two comics called um, Maximumble and Minimumble, Mini Mumble. And uh, you can find him at, if you do a quick search on Instagram. Chris Halbeck uh, is his name. And um, he, uh, he has this really brilliant swipe feature that I was like, oh, wow, that's really... You know, I've studied the history of comics, and uh, to me, this was such a unique way of reading comics that I had never seen before. And um, you, there's no way to, for your eye to cheat and jump ahead of the punch. 
and there's no way to know what's coming because you can really only click one panel at a time. Um, and so if you've read the kind of, uh, I dislike the format, but the Marvel comics where you sort of read panel to panel on, I don't right. know what that format is. It Comixology? Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, Comixology uses it. Uh, several do, but yes, Comixology. Yeah. Primarily. So for me, with comic books, I never liked that because for me, the composition of a comic book page was always so important in your, mm -hmm. your eye reading it holistically and panel by panel. But for comic strips, uh, it, uh, and, and that could be a totally subjective read, but for comic strips, it reads so much better to me to read panel by panel. Um, so when I saw Chris Hallbeck doing it, I was like, you know what, I, I really want to try this. And so um, started putting them up panel by panel, and uh, I'm amazed not only how much I enjoy them, how much my wife, who has been reading my stuff for 20 years, likes reading it this way, and then also what the reaction has been. Um, I mean, the growth, I only started doing it a month and a half ago or so, and it's been 4,000 new followers uh, in, and growing exponentially. So clearly wow. this is a form people like to read it in. Right. Um, so currently it's at 6,000. Had you and I talked last week, it would have been 5,000. Mm. And had we talked two weeks prior to that, it would have been 4,000. So it's like it's, it's a ridiculous growth uh, spurt. Um, uh, so I highly recommend it for any cartoonists that are out there. Uh, you can take a look at either my feed on Instagram or Chris Halbeck's, or I think also Oatmeal does the side to sides. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, 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 an important feature that I would recommend for any cartoonist thinking about trying it is to make sure you add the sort of indicator that you should swipe for more for the next panel. Because some people oh. assume some people will it. assume it's just one image. Like, All right, well, I guess that's fun. <laughs> but uh, when, you, when you let them know very quickly and easily that, no, you, this is kind of new to Instagram and you should s keep swiping, uh, right. people really, really enjoy it. Um, so I can't recommend that enough. Oh. Well, that's, that's, that is a fun way. I, I do it, but I didn't think about the process of doing it. I just knew I was doing it. So I, I, I'm okay with the comiXology thing, just to, just to uh, defend comiXology a little bit. I, I agree with you. It, it takes away in the way that... Uh, when you're reading a comic book and it zooms into one piece of the work that wasn't really necessarily meant to be zoomed in. Uh, and so it, it kind of breaks something for me as well, but also on smaller devices, it's kind of a necessity. And uh, yes, so. like if you're going to try to read uh, X-Men on a phone, that's right. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. You have to do it this way. I think it's because I've only ever read comicsology on an iPad. And when, it, when you're suddenly zooming in, like you said, to a panel that was drawn to be an inch and a half wide, mm -hmm. and then you're looking at it in, you know, two or 3,000 pixels wide uh, resolution, you're like, gee, yikes, this is drawn <laughs> terribly. And what, well, it's like, of course it's drawn terribly because the artist meant, to, meant it to be an original format, an inch and a half wide. And right. you're, you're judging that panel the same way you're judging the splash panel on the next page, which right. is gorgeously detailed and beautiful. And it, I, there's something about it that takes away from it um, when that happens. I don't know. It's I just, agree. Again, it's totally subjective on my part. I just, the aesthetic doesn't appeal to me. You're, you're, you're pointing out a problem that is, is factual, and that is a problem. And I have seen, and there's an art to it. There's, I have seen people who have, I'm assuming they have someone who is going through and uh, making those decisions. It's kind of like what we used to do with pan and scan on TV. Uh, when you'd have a letterboxed film, you would try to, you know, find the right areas to focus on. And there's an art to it. And I think there's an art to it as well, uh, as far as people breaking down these comics and how much time they're putting into it. I can't say. Yeah. What was the one that we talked about last year? It was Mod Fire or Me Made Media Fire? Made Fire. Made Fire. Made Fire. Ex like excellent job. They're very, and that's because it's. Yeah, it, it's kind of bridging the gap with what you said, Dave. It's it's like this in between where it's like, well, we're not going to let you zoom in on everything automatically. We're not just going to go full screen, but we're going to curate the experience where you get to see the whole panel. But every time you tap the screen, you get a different speech balloon from a different character. And there was music involved. Um, there was some free comics from Blizzard about World of Warcraft and one of their expansion launches. And, um, so yeah, I guess it would have been like last summer and, um, and I found that really engaging. Like I really enjoyed the music and the score kind of like sucking you into this multimedia world. Um, but I enjoyed the fact that it was paced. Like if something was, was happening really slowly, 
then you would tap and get a big balloon and you would tap and you get another big speech balloon. But if something was supposed to be fast paced, every time you tapped, you'd only get like a couple of words in each balloon. So you like, you'd be, you'd be kind of really engaging more frequently with a action scene or something that was supposed to happen faster. And it was a really interesting way to kind of bridge that gap. Cause I have the same opinion that you do with the, like the little thumbnails and then you're looking at it full screen and it just, it, it kind of takes you right out of it. Right. Yeah. Although I, I, I see what you mean about the interactivity of the, the, voice bubbles. And when I've seen that done well, I'm like, oh, okay, I can see for a certain kind of person. But I, uh, for me, the music edition and like the motion comic kind of editions that they sometimes do where all of a sudden Spider-Man has been digitally <laughs> sliced out and goes swinging across the panel. <laughs> mm. And for, I, I, I become, no one becomes a bigger old man about it than I do. I'm like, this <laughs> is not what I wanted in my comic book. I don't yeah. want this. Um, yeah. So I'm like, uh, you know, if I'm reading Saga, I want to imagine the music um, in that club that they walk into. I don't want them to tell me what music is going to be in the club. I, unless, yeah. you know, I, I can see that if someone wanted to curate, uh, like the creator wanted to curate, like this is what this club on this planet would sound like in Saga, then you go, all yeah. right, well, that's fine. But when I know I, it's some intern at, co at Comixology going, hey, what can I get for free <laughs> off of a, of a music yeah, album. yeah, yeah. And I think the advantage that Blizzard had in that situation is that they have a game that exists. They have a world and sounds that exist, so they can pull music from the game oh, and put I it see. into the comic. Yeah. So then, it, yes. so the, at that specific instance, it worked. But yeah, no, I totally agree. I don't, I don't want to see c comics move, but I liked the curated pacing of the reading. I thought that was a right. Was so, nice. Okay, I, I see what you mean now. So I, I admit yeah. that it was actually Blizzard owned sounds. I like so me being a Star Trek fan. Like if if when you were swiping panel to panel, if there was a say a Star Trek panel uh, comic and you know a, a comic Picard walked in and you heard the door swish of that specific to Star Trek, I could see why you'd be like, all right, now I'm a little bit in the world. That's kind of fun that you would. Yeah. So not being a Blizzard player, I can see though how the sound effects from that world would influence a comic. Right. Uh, yeah, again, though, I just like I'm, I get very get off my lawn about it, that it's um, <laughs> it just feels like this is not how a comic book should be. <laughs> but then again, I am immediately putting my comic strips onto Instagram in a swipe format. So who am I to judge? Right. <laughs> Hypocrisy. Thy name is cartoonist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can, can I uh, mention a little bit of pressure for Joel that I think he is now the only person on this uh, show who is not Red Saga, right? Uh, no, incorrect. I started oh, reading Oh, you did Saga. pick it up. Uh, yeah, I picked up the first trade years right. ago, and then I just didn't keep going with it. It just it boils down to how I spend my free time, and I have not been reading very much in the last few years. But I, I do like it. I did, I did enjoy the, the world. Um, and I've got several friends that really enjoy Saga, and they highly recommend it. So Okay, very good. Yeah, I'm not much of a comic book reader anymore, but I will read Saga anytime I get the the a chance. Oh, yeah. It's I think it's delightful. I think the um the artwork her her artwork is some of the best going. Um, I think the only criticism is sometimes the story there's no there there, but the characters are delightful and uh, I, I guess what I mean when I say there's no there there is you can feel them kind of making it up as they go along, but that's right. fine. That's the nature of comics. Um, so yeah. Uh, uh, but I find the, the, the characters are delightful. The artwork is gorgeous. It's among the mm. prettiest artwork in all of comics. Um, so anyway, there's that. Yeah, I'm going to, I think the, I've been waiting to pick up like a couple of solid trades to just kind of di digest all at once as opposed to the, um, yeah, the trade, I, for me, the trades are the way to do it. I'm, I'm one of those comics readers that if, if I read comics, there's no way I'm going to read a floppy anymore. Like I, I don't even try. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. wait for trades. Um, and so I think that's just the nature of the beast is that 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 form of comics was for a different era, um, I feel like. And I don't know why floppies still exist, but there you go. <laughs> True story. That's, this, is the, this is the flip side of me being get off my lawn. Is that now, <laughs> get with the times, Marvel. Like, I don't know why. I, I see why that business is failing, as I don't know why anyone would buy a floppy, but there you go. Mm -hmm. is they're, they're trying some things. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we, we also have uh, on our extended network uh from frog pants is uh major spoilers and they talk a lot about uh floppies and they've been talking about some things that are going on in the industry uh and it's it's worth a listen but i don't want to miss out on at least uh mentioning and talking about drive comic we're we're wrapping up here and we don't want to miss out on uh any aspect of what you're doing currently uh so tell us just really quick a little bit about drive comic and if there's any new uh new things going on or how it's just going in general Oh, okay. Yeah. So Drive, uh, I started um, about seven or eight years ago, maybe more actually. Um, <clears throat> and it's a long form sci-fi story. The idea being that it's goofy, uh, delightful characters, but set in a very serious storyline. So 
it's kind of a mix between uh, the goofiness of A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but set in a universe like Frank Herbert's Dune. Um, and I have always been a huge sci-fi fan, and this has been the big love of my life for the creatively for the last three or four years. Um, I so we just finished the the big Act One and collected that into a really gorgeous hardcover, um, also kickstarted. Nice. And uh, that one just came out a year, no, half a year ago, and it's been delightful. And we're about halfway through the second act of the story. Um, and I am I am more proud of Drive probably than anything else I'm working on at the moment. I love oh. Drive so much. So if you want to try, if you've never heard of myself or my work and want to try one thing from this interview, uh, Drive at drivecomic.com is uh, one of the, m- the most favorite things I've ever done. I, I can't speak highly enough about it. I love it so much. I love um, it too. Yeah, and then in, in the last couple of years, I've I've loved the way the universe has been established enough where I've invited in other cartoonists. So you'll have Eisner winners like uh, Tony Cliff and Ryan mm-hmm. North and Chris Hastings, who does Gwenpool, and uh, Zach Wienersmith of SNBC. And oh. they've all come in to do short guest stories, kind of like the old Star Wars tales on in Dark Horse oh, comics. Oh, um, right, right. And it's been delightful to hire friends that I loved and then set them editorially completely free to do whatever they want. Uh, I've really enjoyed that as a creator. So, um, again, it's at, it's at drivecomic.com. I won't, I, don't, I won't tell too much about the story other than to say it's, it's a set about 400 years in the future. And it's, a, it's set in a second Spanish empire who has built their, uh, their human empire off of technology from a crashed alien ship. Of and course. The, the underpinnings there is that the aliens... Um, semi-revere their tech as inspired creations and so want it back with an almost religious fervor. So that's the, that's the basic underpinnings of the drive story. That is a good, that is a good pitch. I like it. Hey, can I still pick up the, uh, I, I missed the Kickstarter. Can I still pick up the book? Uh, you can, yes. That's uh, Sheldonstore.com has all of my books available for it. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's real. I can't say enough of how beautiful it came out. I it, it really is one of the best things I've ever done. Is that hardcover? Excellent, uh, Joel. Uh, I what should we do? Should we give Matthew uh, the reins and let him ask the the last best question ever, or do we still? Have yeah, I think I think giddy up. I'm I'm, I'm curious about that one. I'm, I'm suddenly Matthew. I'm I'm all like official. <laughs> <laughs> that or you're in trouble. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Well, then he would have included my middle initial. That's when oh. you know the damage is coming, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, Dave, who are some? I mean, you already name dropped one artist, uh, so we know how to follow one. But are there any other artists that leap into your mind that our listeners should probably be paying attention to? Uh, as far as new stuff that they might not have heard of, or as far as, uh, well, I mentioned Chris Halbeck on Instagram. Uh, Kate Beaton, I mentioned. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else I mentioned. Saga in Comic Book World. Uh, I've been a fan of um, the artwork of East of West, which is a, another image comic. And then also their other one called Black Science, which is a, a fun kind of Twilight Zone, uh, but also Lost in Space kind of storyline that they have Ooh. gone. Uh, another one I always like to recommend because a lot of people know about it, Joe Martini at Hubers. Really written uh, comedy wise, um, right? Like I love, I love, I love Adam's work. His uh, Bug Martini is fantastic. Bob Bug Martini, that's what we call it. Okay, yes. And then um, uh, another cartoonist that's an up and comer that I love her work a lot, uh, Rosemary Valero O'Connell. If you don't get a chance, uh, you can look up her website. She's um, working on various titles and various projects at the moment, and she's great. Um, and uh, it's a good short summary of stuff that I find interesting <laughs> lately. That's great. That's a great list. Holy Moses, Matt! Did you catch all of those? No, I he didn't say I did not. <laughs> oh well, at least if if you caught at least half of those, those are some great recommendations. I recognize a lot of those, but there's a few that I didn't. I'm gonna go back and pick my pick my favorite as well. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for being on the show, taking the time to sit down with us and uh, catch us up on what you're doing. Uh, love the work. Looking forward to uh, future stripped type of documentaries. I'm really looking forward to that kind of stuff. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, best of luck on episode 309 next week. Yeah, and you'll be back in a scant three years, right? We'll, yeah, we'll we'll plan to be we'll on you... uh, episode 614. That's what we'll do. <laughs> we'll, we'll plan now. I'm just going to put that little marker in there, and then we'll see if we can do it. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dave, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Great. Have a good night, guys. See you, too. All right. Oh, that was great. I loved the interview with Dave. Uh, 
I hated that he was having a little trouble there with the Skype. Or I say yeah. him, it is just as likely that it was on my end uh, with, with the Skype. You know how that stuff goes. I wanted to let Dave go ahead and go so he could go spend some time with his family. Thank you again so much for uh, today for for uh, joining us and uh, catching up on just catching up on everything that uh, he's doing. Uh, Joel Duggan uh, of Forge Publishing. Where can people visit you? Uh, a couple of different places. You can visit me on Instagram, as I mentioned before, uh, and you can do that at Forge Publishing too. It's a great way to kind of keep up with what uh, what we're doing there. That's kind of like my main visual way to to share a lot of what uh, what we're doing. And uh, Piper's book is officially released. If you pre ordered, mm. those have been mailed. If you ordered on the Kickstarter, those have been mailed, uh, and the book is now for sale. So if you missed the uh, the initial Kickstarter, then you can still pick yourself up a copy. Uh, I'm in the process of actually adding a couple of Piper's prints to the store so that people can bundle and, and get some cool stuff. So yeah, check that out at forgepublishing.com and then follow me by name uh, everywhere else, Joel Duggan, uh, joelduggan.com. And hey, while, while you're out there, check out uh, the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast. Oh, yeah, do that. Do that. Check that out. It's, it's awesome. And also, Matthew Descharm, thank you for being on the show tonight. Where can people uh, see you? Man, I, I, <laughs> I always feel bad coming after Joel because he does like a million different right. things. <laughs> don't feel do bad it. because you have free time <laughs> 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 so uh yeah you can find my stuff on youtube just do a search for matthew ducharme or Matt the one right latest thing we can see uh is number 45 is martha is that the batman superman joke is that what yeah that is the last one i did and it's probably the last one for a while i bet because I, I'm, I'm currently working on something bigger oh something bigger Matt the Wad Supersize, I hope. Uh, you can follow me at the Brian Dunaway on Twitter. Uh, you can go to my website, BrianDunaway.com. I usually post uh, many things about what I'm doing. I also do another podcast uh, with some guys called Scott Johnson, Brian Ibbett, and Randy Jordan, uh, Film Sack, where we review films weekly uh, on uh, Netflix. Uh, did they hold up? We don't know. Usually not. Sometimes they do. Sometimes. Most times, not so much. Visit everything we do on ComicsCoastToCoast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Comic C2C. And uh, that's it. Joel, have we already lined up and uh, verified our interview for next week? Have we already done that? That's a really good question. And we've got lots of interviews coming. And I have to open up the schedule doc because I didn't know you were going to ask me that question. We're going to see You're how fast Google can catch up with welcome. me. And it sounds like the answer is... Google oh, yeah. was going to crash, and then yeah. I'm going to say that no. We the closest uh, interview we have is Scott Brown, uh, and that's coming up on September 7th. So Excellent. we have um, we've got some time to figure things out, and then you've got Dragon Con coming up too. I do have Dragon Con coming up, sci-fi uh, comic convention, sci-fi and fantasy. If you're into that kind of thing, I'll be down there uh, Labor Day weekend. If you want to stop by and say hi, I'll be in the podcast track. Check us out. We'll see you guys next week. Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. I okay. Am not a fan. I'm not a fan. Matt yeah, that, is like, I read all the books, but uh, yeah, I, I just don't much care for that uh, universe, that world. Yeah. It's, mm. it's a little bitter. It's a little bitter pill if uh, it's not a happy bitter. place. Yeah. No. It's not a, not a happy place.